Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, with winter firmly set in for a long visit and the holidays in full swing, it's time for the annual Christmas pageant at the tiny Happy Hollow School. One room, one teacher, and three students to ring in the season. And what is Christmas in the Midwest without a fireplace? They're dirty, smelly, and inefficient, but they enrich the lives of everyone who has one. Winter is a bragging right for many folks who tough out the bitter months of the year. And in Nebraska, it's just not a good winter unless it's hard, cold, and memorable. And finally, Roger Welsh sits down for an interview with the man known only as Heavy Duty, the mysterious anonymous trucker who sends postcards to Nebraska's shut-ins. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. At one time, Nebraska had more school districts than any other state in the Union. These days, more and more country schools are consolidating into ever larger, more efficient units. But now and then, here and there, you can still find a one-room country school. In fact, Nebraska has a couple of hundred elementary schools with one teacher. Like this one, District 74, Happy Hollow School near Weston. So if that should happen tonight... I would be glad to fill in, ma'am. Just don't, just go without it. I know! Dodge, you're perfect! Oh, not me. Kids give me a headache. Now, Dawes, we do want our pension check to start right away, don't we? Colin Horacek is the teacher at Happy Hollow, which she describes as a three-window school. And she, like teachers all across America, is helping her students prepare for their Christmas program. Christopher and Dawes can be Santa Little louder. Don't say really only fair. It'll be a big night with as many as 60 or 70 local farmers coming to see how our class is doing. Okay, now if that happens and that chair isn't on stage, we forget it some way. Just dress without it. Get the caps off. Michael, get the box. You know Helen is encouraged this year because she has more actors, stagehands, technicians, musicians, and singers to work with than she's had the past few years. Oh my God. Those pencils have a way of slipping out of hands, don't they? Okay. Her student this body has increased by 50% this year, now, when you make from this two students here, you put to three. We'll Michael Heiser, age five. Hammer, house. Douglas Heiser, age eight. Uh, is that a tiger or is that a cat? Uh, and Loreen Martz, okay. yes, age yes, ten. No. Why don't you read through the questions? Okay. Okay. Does matter have weight? Yes. Thank you. Let's get this thing through and get it over with. How about it? Okay. Do you know what we're going to do? I look with wonder at these three as they prepare to stand on their school's makeshift stage in front of an enormous audience, enormous for this county, and fill an evening with song, story, drama, and entertainment. <laughs> okay, I won't embarrass you, Doug. They become my kids, and I just feel about them as though they were my own, and I feel responsible for them, very responsible for their education. It must be tough to see them leave when they graduate. I have stood here and cried every time I've had an eighth grade graduate leave. <laughs> Michael, Douglas, and Loreen are responsible for every detail of the annual Christmas production. They have a long heritage to protect. The District 74 school is nearly a century old. Okay, fall asleep. Okay, this, that way you don't have to look at the crowd. And the Christmas program has been a part of the school year as long as anyone can recall, as long as records have been kept. Well, I heard you were too sick to come and see me. Thank you, Santa. Thank you, Santa. This is great. This is great. Oh, 
always be your friend. You know what? I feel better already. And I feel my Christmas has really come. In the Naughty Mouse, two grandmas find out how brave they really are. Oh my gosh! Let's go! Helen wanted to retire from teaching last year, but her students, her friends, wouldn't let her. So here she is again, gently encouraging them toward another successful Christmas, her 21st at Happy Hollow. I'm too fat. <laughs> Are you sure? Let's see how much you really weigh. This play is entitled Santa's Stomach Problems. The entire evening is under her guidance, her love. successful evening for the young performers of Nebraska District 74. Michael, Douglas, and Lorene will go home tired and relieved after their performance, confident in the knowledge that even though some might wonder about what kind of education you can get at a public school where there are only three students, these kids will graduate into the bigger world beyond Happy Hollow's three-window school, able to take on any challenge. After all, Helen Horacek told them they could. Let them through. Let them through. If you're going downstairs, go. That's it. There you go. Fireplaces are dirty nuisances. This one sets off our fire alarm every morning when I build my first fire of the day, mostly because I forget to open the damper. I'm told that Fireplaces, even this one that was built to give off heat, are remarkably inefficient in terms of the amount of heat they give in return for the tons of wood that they burn up. Cleaning this thing is a terrible mess. The holes here in the floor are where some burning paper once fell out, burnt holes in our brand new plastic flooring. Linda put the rug here to cover it up. I used to throw the ashes out on the driveway because I was told they're good for traction. And then I found out the nails in the kindling are good for flat tires. So why do I tolerate, no, why do I treasure this beast that dominates our entire house? Well, of course, there's the romance of staring into the fire on a cold winter night, a glass of good scotch in hand, good friends laughing and arguing, the perfume of the cedar and oak. But I think there's more to a fireplace than romance. This house has a perfectly good heating unit. It goes off and on without us even noticing. It blows warmth to all corners of the house. 
So why do I love my fireplace? Well, I poke around in the coals. I fool around with the kindling. I find just the right piece of wood. I generally manage the fire. As I burn that wood, I think about the day I cut it. This is some ash that I got over in Cairo. This is cottonwood that Dan Selden, Dennis Adams, and I cut two years ago. We laughed and nearly killed ourselves when the tree fell the wrong way. I cut this oak 12 years ago with a precious clutch of friends and my children. My children were really children then. We buried the trailer in my old 69 Chevy van in the mud. Had to go find a farmer to pull us out with a tractor. Where were you 12 years ago? In a shed out in the farmyard, I have a few treasured pieces of wood from an old log cabin I once salvaged. This wood was cut by a German homesteader in 1870. As I sit here, I wonder what was going on when this tree was growing. Buffalo rubbed against this tree. Indians who'd never seen a white man camped in its shade. This tree was growing before Brigham Young walked the Mormon Trail, before the Pony Express. This tree was alive when George Washington was alive. It was fully grown when Abraham Lincoln became president. The warmth I'm enjoying right now is the sunshine of a day in 1860, 50 years before my people left Russia for the United States. Hearth, heat, heart. There are inefficiencies that enrich life. In fact, sometimes I suspect that it's mostly inefficiencies that enrich life. I stare into my fire and I dream. I dream about the past and I dream about the future. I think about the trees I'm burning, and I think about the trees that are growing on my tree farm here in Danabrog, Nebraska. I wonder about the people generations from now who will be burning the wood from my trees. Don't talk to me about efficiency. Efficiency has nothing to do with a good fireplace. ended with a series of winters that really weren't much to complain about or to brag about. Day after day, week after week of warm, balmy temperatures, no wind, no snow, no cold, not winters at all. The first winter of this decade promises to do better, and I, for one, am more than ready for it. A couple of years ago, one of the local newspapers ran a feature asking various folks around here what they do to avoid the winter blahs. My reply was that I don't get the winter blahs. I get the winter raws. In my opinion, winter is the best season of the year to be in the northern half of America. I can judge how good a winter is by how many days out of the season I have to wear this down coat. I like winters when the ground gets hard as iron, when the trees are covered with frost, when the ice in the streets has been there so long it gets black, when snow drifts last long enough to become landmarks, 
to have names. I want a winter that's a winter. I'm not alone in my insistence on seasonal drama. Plains writer Mari Sandoz spoke with a kind of perverse pride of the savage winters of the plains. She wrote, the annual January and February thaws only crusted the snow. Travel was almost impossible. Even the tough feet of the few cattle that survived the winter left reddish stains where they struggled through the drifts in search of bare spots on wind-blown knolls. Snow-cleared paths were iron underfoot. Willa Cather wrote that winter's winds say to us, this is reality, whether you like it or not. All those frivolities of summer, the light and shadow, the living mask of green that trembled over everything, they were lies. And this is what was underneath. This is the truth. It's not just the coziness of the warm retreats at the fireplace or uptown at the tavern, either. It's a form of reverse bragging, people underscoring the power of their own spirit by calling attention to the size and strength of the winter villains they have to face and endure. Just as folks in New York like to talk about the rigors of living in that environment, the people of the plains like shaking their heads and saying, cold enough for you? They want snowstorms and cold they'll remember well into July. They won't admit it, but they want it so cold the trees pop and the ice rumbles and growls down on the river. Folks in America's rural countryside want winter stories they can tell their grandchildren. Folks in Danabrog want it cold enough that they can tell about the time sounds froze. They had to thaw out their conversations in a frying pan just to hear what they were saying. They want a winter like the one that Eric Nielsen tells about when it was so cold he came out to find a dog frozen to the front tire of his car. Or when Ray Harfum said it was so cold, folks were going to church just to hear about hell. They want a winter like the one Bob Peterson tells about, when he actually saw a lawyer with his hands in his own pockets. If they're going to have to stay here on the plains through the winter anyway, they want it cold enough that smoke freezes in the chimney and cows give ice cream. In their hearts, Americans of the plains want a winter worthy of their complaints. With equivalent passion, but perhaps less poetry, they want to share the words of Lauren Isley. This is the heart's strange season, brave but lost under the cold blue pole star of the frost. Real plainsmen don't want winter to be comfortable, they want it to be memorable. When you're driving, do you prefer the side roads to the interstate? I do if I have the time. It beats the, the hustle and bustle. And you can get out and drive at your own speed and go through the little towns. And just another truck stop, just another semi, just another driver. No, not quite. Not just another driver. Because the driver I'm thinking about is heavy duty truly a legend in his own time. I just came across I-90 up in Idaho and Montana, and that is just so beautiful, just super beautiful scenery. 70 across Wyoming and 431 down in Alabama. Well, for all the traffic out here, this is still a pretty lonely job, isn't it? I'd say it is, it is, it is, but it's... His reputation is not so much as a truck driver, as a gentle heart who cares about those who need love most and often have too little. You suppose our trucker lives in a house like that? I don't think He's got kind of a sense of humor, it's hard to tell. A few years ago, I sent you a postcard from Nebraska about an anonymous driver who called himself Heavy Duty and how he sent postcards to nursing homes throughout the country. I had no idea who he was. No one knew who he was. Well, guess what? 
I've found heavy duty. And he reluctantly agreed to talk as long as I didn't reveal his identity. H heavy duty, how did you get started in the idea of sending postcards to nursing homes? I just thought it was nice to, to share some of the beautiful places I've been with, with people that are shut-ins, that can't. Have you thought at all about letting people know who it was who was sending these postcards? Are you going to be forever anonymous? I think I would go with the being forever anonymous. I kind of think that after you meet them, then you kind of lose the, um, the mystery or they're no longer as interested as they were. He began his gentle habit because he was once visiting a relative in a nursing home like this when an old man pulled him aside and begged him to listen to a couple of his stories. He said it wouldn't take long because his son was coming to visit him shortly. And this little guy had uh, both of his legs taken off the knees and, and uh, was just so happy to have somebody to talk to. He really was. And he just, uh, boy, he hung on to me for dear life. Heavy duty learned later that the son rarely came to visit his father, but it was the hope of such visits that sustained him. And heavy duty decided that he too would become the source for that kind of hope. If he would decide to stop here, he'd better be ready for a lot of hugs, because he'd get them. <laughs> In the decade Heavy Duty has been sending his cards from around the nation, he's become something of a patron saint at a nursing home in Schuyler, Nebraska. Through his cards, the folks at the Schuyler home have become fond of Heavy Duty, and yet they don't know his name, or the color of his truck, or where he's from. How did you decide to, to make them a recipient of your postcards? Because I'd gone by them several times. So you were just driving by, saw a nursing home maybe with some people out in front, and right, wow. Eventually, they put a sign out by the highway, hoping to lure heavy duty into their home, to talk with him, thank him, share something of their lives with him. Heavy duty never did stop by, although he did write that he saw the sign. news, blues, and views. I tried to take a picture of that super neat sign through my windshield without stopping the other day. It came I know they were the ones that got you looking for me. I still write to them. I, I wish I could write to all of them. You know, they're, they're still trying to figure out who you are, and we're still not going to tell them. <laughs> I scribble a lot of stuff in here. Uh, people I've met and people that have asked me to write to them. And how, how many pages you got on that list? I'm not sure, five or six, but here's Skyler. Skyler Nursing Center in Skyler, Nebraska. Here is uh, Van Allen's Nursing Home in Little Falls, New York. And uh, here is Yale Nursing Home in Yale, Oklahoma that I wrote to for a long time. Here is a uh, nursing home in, in uh, St. Genevieve, Missouri that they wrote to me about. And uh, I, I... Are you gonna be sending some postcards, do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> One made out to my friend Mabel and uh, the Scotter Nursing Home. There's a, a lady in a home that I've never stopped, but uh, if, I, if I miss her very often, she writes me and tells me to get with the program, that I'm getting behind and she wants me to keep writing and almost cusses me out more. <laughs> Heavy Duty is still on the road, still sending postcards to nursing homes, still a big loving lug out there on the cruel highways, still caring, and he's still anonymous. He says it's more fun that way. Heavy Duty is the word for it. I don't want to be called a hero. I really don't. It's not important to know who I am. It's, it's just not. <laughs> Makes me feel good. Makes me feel good if it makes other people feel good. <laughs>